Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Mike Pence, Vice President of the United States of America, came to the Middle East and to Jerusalem to firm up friendships and to galvanize relationships. That was his agenda. That is what he accomplished. The Vice President did not come to patronize. He did not come to moralize about the virtues of peace. The ridicule and the invective that many in the mainstream press have heaped upon Pence in evaluating his trip and the speech he delivered before the Knesset is at best misguided. At worst, it is pure hyperbole. An editorial in the New York Times, the undisputed paper of record, insisted that the, quote, trip did not go as planned, unquote, as if to say that the goals and the objectives of the trip were not fulfilled. That would be correct if they understood the goals and objectives of the trip, but surely they did not. The point was made when the editorial went on to write that one of the trip's goals was to, quote, and this is important, nudge the Israelis and the Palestinians toward peace. The speech Vice President Pence delivered at the Knesset was written with one specific goal in mind. The Vice President, in conjunction with his boss in Washington, wanted to make it perfectly clear that the United States is committed to Israel as more than an ally, that the United States is a true friend of Israel, that goal was simple to articulate, but hard to achieve. The language of the speech needed to steer clear of preaching and moralizing. Pence needed to convey his country's commitment and love as more than a political stance to placate a single party or leader. He wanted to touch the average Israeli, and he did that by reaching deep into their souls and touching on, what, what, on that which makes Israel special. He articulated what Israelis know for themselves, but sometimes have difficulty putting into words. And then, in response, a column in Haaretz derisively proclaimed that the vice president was, quote, more Zionist than the Zionists, unquote. And pundits and talking heads across America bemoaned that it will be just about impossible to roll back such a pro-Israel speech and still convince the Palestinians that the United States can still be counted on to build the bridges leading to peace. On this issue, these usually smart analysts totally missed the point. The purpose of Pence's visit was not to push for a peace plan between the Israelis and the Palestinians. How could it be? The Palestinians were boycotting him. They made it publicly clear that they were not even going to meet with the Vice President of the United States on his first official trip to the region. Egypt and Jordan met with him. They understood Pence's mission. They know that Pence sought them out to affirm the bond between the United States and that which was created between these two Middle East states, that they have peace treaties with Israel. During those visits, Vice President Pence emphasized that whatever differences do exist are marginal. He was there to make it clear that the important strategic link connecting Egypt, Jordan, and the United States is what matters. Part of that link is the fight against Islamic extremism. Another part were the treaties that they have with Israel. The Palestinians understand that the reason for this trip by the vice president. Months in advance, they realized that the Trump administration was actively patching up the damage the Obama administration had done to Israel. But rather than manning up, the Palestinian leadership chose the adolescent response. Shunning the United States was the equivalent of thinking you can punish your parents by closing your bedroom door. Boycotting the vice president of the United States was an immature reaction. It was also self-defeating. The Palestinians have nowhere else to go to achieve their goals. The European Union cannot help them. China, Russia, the Arabic world aren't helping them. The Palestinians made yet another in a series of tactical errors. If they would have thought it through, they would have realized that the United States, through Vice President Pence, could have helped them. Had he been invited to deliver a speech in Ramallah, it would have been as forthright and compelling as the speech delivered in the Knesset. The vice president would have articulated the U.S. commitment to finding a solution to the problem plaguing Palestinians and Israelis. Pence's message was unlike that of former U.S. President Barack Obama, who, at the Reform Temple in Manhattan, 
explained his decision to chastise, humiliate, and endanger Israel by not vetoing UN Security Council Resolution 2334 in the last month of his presidency, which condemned Israel by explaining that friends need to criticize friends. Pence's speech was a stark departure from that last administration. Of course there will be disagreements between the United States and Israel, but those disagreements will be handled discreetly behind closed doors. Israel will not be marginalized, manipulated, or endangered by the United States and the Security Council or anywhere else. This trip was a successful journey. President Trump was able to express unwavering support for Israel. Vice President Pence was his willing messenger. On to another essential issue, which is deeply troubling and moving. During a protest in Iran, a young woman jumped on a telephone box and slowly and deliberately took off her white headdress, her hijab. Tying the hijab on a black stick, she waved it like a flag. This was a massive move of defiance against the regime that has, since 1979, required all women to cover their hair. Twitter and social media lit up. The incident was first tweeted by an onlooker named Armin Navabi, who posted the video and wrote this. This woman in Iran took off her hijab to protest the mandatory Islamic dress code imposed on Iranian women. Hashtag I stand with her. Hashtag Iran protest. Hashtag Islam. Ever since committing that act of brazen protest, the woman who waved her scarf has disappeared. A new hashtag, where is she, is dedicated to finding her. Posters and cartoon memes have been broadcast across social media asking where this woman is. There have been small protest marches in the West. Amnesty International has made an official appeal to the Iranian government to release her. Through social media, it has been determined that the woman is a 31-year-old mother of a toddler. According to another tweet, she was reportedly arrested on December 27th, released and then rearrested. After several weeks, a human rights lawyer came forward and said that her name is Vida Mohavad. We do not know much more, and we hope that she is still alive and has been released. For many, this woman has become a symbol for the Iranian people's protests against an oppressive regime. As a sign of the nerve that she touched within Iranian society, other Iranian women have been captured on video, mimicking her bold and fearless action. In one video, we see a modestly dressed woman maneuver her way into the middle of a traffic circle in Tehran itself. As cars veer to swerve to avoid hitting her, the woman removes her hijab and swings it in the air above her head. A woman burying her hair in Iran is an act of defiance, far more bold and dangerous than streaking was in the United States in the wild 1970s. 7,000 modesty police in Iran are tasked with the narrowly defined job of protecting against bad hijab and immodest dress. Their job was to arrest women and send them off to prison for hijab infractions, like an improperly positioned headdress or a situation in which too much hair is exposed. In December of 2017, that punitive policy eased up a bit. That's when Brigadier General Hussein Rahimi, who had assumed the role that supervises Iran's modesty police, announced that Iran would no longer send women to prison for bad hijab. Instead, he said, they would be sent for re-education, as, uh, as the regime calls it, in counseling centers. He's quoted in the, Daily uh, in the Daily Mail as saying the following. According to a decision, the commander of the police force, those who do not observe Islamic codes will no longer be taken to detention centers, nor judicial files opened on them. We offer courses, and 7,913 people have been educated in these classes so far. Iran has opened 100 of these counseling centers in Tehran province alone. Modesty police are not the only law enforcement agency looking over the shoulders and above the heads of women in Iran. While it's very difficult to get real or current numbers about most things in Iran, traffic police reported that in 2015, 40,000 women with bad hijabs. Many of the women in violation of the law had let their scarves fall as they drove. The police gave many violators light sentences. They were fined and let go, or both. They were fined and their vehicles were sometimes confiscated for bad hijab. In the eyes of the regime, 
This new approach they're taking with regard to bad hijab is considered liberalizing. Once upon a time, open defiance of the hijab was met with severe and swift action. Now it's just swift. The young woman swinging her white hijab on the telephone box is one example of the desire to change, coupled with defiance of a law on the part of Iranian citizenry. A full-blown grassroots revolt is still far off the, on the horizon. Never mistake or misinterpret liberalizing in an oppressive authoritarian regime with liberal democratic governments. This heroic woman stood up and challenged the highly protective and insular leadership that does not take kindly to public challenges outside the boundaries they have carefully constructed. Those boundaries require protesters to utilize the metaphor of language of Islam, not actions and deeds deemed to be Western influence. In throwing off her hijab, this young woman not only made a statement, she violated one of the tenets of Islam. This heroic woman waved a white hijab in defiance, not a white flag of surrender. Coming up next, points of view. Here's what some important voices have been talking about. Let's discuss just one column today. It's a column from the New York Times, and it's authored by Roger Cohen. It was published on December 30th, 2017, and it's entitled, An Israel of Pride and Shame. As you would assume from the title, Cohen is going to describe the greatness of Israel and the United States President Trump, and then lecture Israel and Trump about morality. Cohen wants to teach Israel a moral lesson, especially a lesson about history, symbols, and Jerusalem. He begins by quoting Israel's founding father, David Ben-Gurion. In 1919, David Ben-Gurion, who 29 years later would become the founding prime minister of Israel, dismissed the possibility of peace. Speaking at a public discussion, he said, everyone sees the difficulty of relations between Jews and Arabs, but not everyone sees that there is no solution to that question. There is no solution, there is an abyss, and nothing can fill that abyss. We want Palestine to be ours as a nation. The Arabs want it to be theirs as a nation. Cohen continues saying that Trump was wrong to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. As Cohen puts it, almost a century on, Ben-Gurion's prescience in this statement is clear. Today, Jerusalem contested city is adorned with banners saying, God bless Trump, from Jerusalem, D.C., David's capital, to Washington, D.C. President Trump's rash recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital, its boundaries to be determined, has won him friends in Israel, even as it has envenomed the festering Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One thing is safe to say about 2018, it will not bring peace to the Holy Land. Peace is not built on provocations or ultimate deal fantasy. Now Cohen lambasts religious Zionism and Jewish nationalism in general. He quotes the famous Israeli author Tom Segev, who is very critical of the new Israeli Zionism. The Jews needed a homeland. History proves that. Assimilation never worked. The Holocaust was no more than the culmination. The United Nations in 1947 backed such a homeland. And if I, as a Jew, have lived a privileged life in the diaspora, it is in part because of the pride and strength that the new Jew of Israel forged, never again became more than mere words through Israel's might. But the Israel hoped for by Ben-Gurion has lost itself, corrupted by overreach. The situation is very bad in the occupied territories, Segev said. There is a systematic violation of Palestinians' human rights. Our government is more and more right-wing, racist, anti-Arab, if they were members of a government in Austria, we'd call our ambassador in protest. Cohen concludes by hitting Trump and his U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. He writes, this is the government cheered on by President Trump and an American ambassador, David Friedman, who sounds like the West Bank settlers envoy. This is the government leading Israel nowhere. This is my shame. Cohen is typical of so many pundits. They do not understand the reality on the ground, and they accept a myth. The reality is that Israel is here to stay, and our capital is Jerusalem. That salient fact cannot change. There is, of course, a possibility to have a Palestinian capital in East Jerusalem. But the Palestinians in the Arab world reject that idea. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. Today I want to discuss a series of cartoons connected to the woman who took off her hijab 
and used it as a flag. Twitter lit up about her. There were protests in Boston and New York City, and there were at least five other women who did the same in Iran. They are brave. There are a whole series of cartoons, and I took from the, these from social media. Some from protests, all are powerful. This first depiction is on a purple background where she is holding her flag. Purple symbolizes power and royalty. The cartoon is saying she is correct and the mullahs are wrong. This next set is from a series of posters from a small protest in Boston. They ask, where is she? The question mark is powerful. The image is the same. This time it's on green. Green is one of the classic colors of Iran and Islam. It conveys the power of the future, symbolic of agriculture, and Islamic land. It grounds her with the mission of freedom and connects her to the Islamic society. This next image is a translation from the Farsi, the Persian, asking where is she? Now she's wearing blue, not black, and the background is red. There's a shadow image of her in the red. The red means death, and red, white, and blue is an attempt to connect to the West. Red, white, and blue are the colors of most of the Western world. This next cartoon has her standing on the ledge, holding the white flag, and an evil, ugly serpent is about to devour her. She stands calmly. The message is obvious. This next image is a photo shot, one from the rear. We do not see it often in the social media portrayals. That's why it's so powerful. This next cartoon is a call for freedom and equality using the Iranian colors with the woman standing with her flag, waving it. And finally, we have a picture of the mother and her baby and a poster explaining in French who she is and asking where she is. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Unfortunately, drugs are an epidemic in Israel. The drugs in Israel are either manufactured there, grown there, or smuggled in over the borders of Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. A drug smuggler was shot to death on the Egyptian-Israeli border. The 25-year-old Israeli was shot by other drug smugglers, Egyptians, across the border. Israel is clamping down on cross-border drug smuggling. These smugglers are highly sophisticated and efficient. They're also deadly, and like drug dealers everywhere, they are ruthless. There is cooperation between Egyptians and Israelis when it comes to drug smuggling. Bottom line is this. Drug smuggling is a business transaction. Israel Water Authority just agreed to supply Gaza with electricity to run their two sewage treatment plants. The agreement between the Water Authority and the gas, uh, Gaza Electricity Distribution Company will be implemented in stages. First, three megawatts for sewage treatment center in northern Gaza, and then later on, a treatment center in southern Gaza will get the fuel. The new centers are part of a $75 million project funded by the World Bank and other donor countries. It should be completed in March. Israel is also providing 1.5 megawatts of electricity for a $40 million desalination plant that is being built by the EU. Israel's in a pickle here. Despite Hamas's constant state of war, it is in Israel's interest and best interest to clean up the sewage of Gaza. Gaza's sewage is being dumped into the Mediterranean. It's polluting Israel's beaches and contaminating the water sources. It's a serious problem and has been going on for far too long. Several weeks ago, New Zealand pop star Lord canceled a concert scheduled to take place in Israel. The BDS-inspired cancellation caused quite an uproar. Recently, Lord was in New York City at a benefit for Ally Coalition, an organization that defends and supports the LGBTQ community. Lord told the crowd how nice they were for gathering together in support of such a great cause. A heckler shouted out that there were nice people in Israel too. The heckler was shouted down with obscenities. According to Variety, Lord added the following, I'm sure the Israeli people are very nice, and I can't wait to meet them one day. The BDS movement convinced Lord to cancel her Israeli concert. It was a big deal in the entertainment world and a big victory for BDS. Lovers of Israel will not forget that Lord buckled under BDS pressure. Israel is working hard to clamp down on violent criminal and racist attacks against Palestinians. 
Some of these attacks are known as price tag attacks against Arabs. The term is Hebrew. It's an expression for a retaliatory strike. These attacks are payback for attacks against Israeli Jews. Most recently, there has been graffiti on cars and slashing of tires in Arab villages. The graffiti reads, Arabs out. Police are investigating the incidents and will catch and charge those responsible for the crimes. In that vein, Israel finally successfully extradited Yoshua Elitzor from Brazil. Elitzor was found guilty of murdering a Palestinian and fled the country before his sentencing in 2004. He will now serve his sentence in Israel. These are important illustrations of how Israel is trying to tamp down on extremists, including Israeli extremists. Israel really is a society of law where Arabs are equal citizens. Russian President Vladimir Putin complimented North Korea Supreme Commander Kim Jong-un. He called Kim Jong competent and mature and added that Kim Jong was handling a complex global situation in a calm, mature manner. These are Putin's exact words. Kim Jong-un is an absolutely competent and already mature politician who has solved his strategic task. He is a nuclear warhead and a global range missile. Putin continued on saying that Kim Jong-un is cleaning up the situation, smoothing it, calming it. This is a perfect Putin moment. What Russia's leader is really doing is complimenting North Korean leader on how he's handling Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. It is a direct attack against Trump. Trump and Kim Jong have had been flamboyantly bickering ever since Trump assumed the presidency. The exchange got so wild that there were even those who thought it might lead to military, perhaps even nuclear attacks or even war. And in the end, who was the calming force? In Putin's eyes, the responsible mature leader is Kim Jong-un of North Korea. This is not just an attack on Trump. It is also a way of buttering up Kim Jong-un for something important in the very near future. As promised, the United States delivered the last batch of 12 Black Hawk helicopters to Jordan as part of a plan to bolster Jordanian troops and security and help them better defend themselves against the Islamic extremists like Al-Qaeda and ISIS. It was no surprise that the Jordanian King Abdullah announced also that he affirms his support for the only peace solution possible in his eyes, the two-state solution with East Jerusalem as the capital of the Palestinian state. Quote, I think our views on Palestine and Jerusalem are well known to you. We do believe in a two-state solution with East Jerusalem as a capital for the Palestinians, end quote. The King of Jordan made himself perfectly clear. It is his belief that the best solution to the Palestinian-Israeli problem is for East Jerusalem to be the capital of the Palestinian state and West Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel. Most Israelis would agree with this plan. So would the United States. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the United States Constitution preserves our right to protest and challenge the government in the First Amendment? It reads, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. This right is also found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 20, and in the International Covenant of Political and Human Rights, Article 21. It all goes back to Moses, who challenged Pharaoh, telling him that freedom was a right of the children of Israel. Let my people go, he said. Moses argued that the children of Israel had rights and dignities to be free and pursue their aspirations as individuals and as a people. The book of Exodus became a blueprint for freedom and revolution against the press of leaders. Moses demanded it. It is a right for all people. His movement of exodus and revolution informs all movements the fight to cast off oppression and tyranny. It is a spectacular legacy. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. We 
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.